Happy Mother's Day, Victory Church. We are so glad you decided to join us today, wherever you are. Maybe that's in your car, maybe your living room. Hey, maybe it's even from your bed. No matter what, we expect that you are going to experience God in a powerful way. So lean in and just open yourself up to the opportunity that God might be speaking to you. Well, if it's your first time with us today, I want to extend an especially warm welcome to you. We are so honored you decided to worship with us. No matter if it's your first time or your hundredth time, I want to invite everybody to fill out our Smart Connect card right now. The information's on the screen, and it's actually going to send you a follow-up text that says you can text in a prayer request. I want to encourage you to do that today. There is a team of people every week dedicated to praying over every single one of those prayer requests. So go ahead, fill out that Smart Connect card, let us know you're worshiping with us, and let us pray with you this week. Well, before we begin worship, I'd love to pray over all of us today. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and you are here, God, that there is no distance when we worship together in spirit and truth. And so, Lord, I ask that you would minister to each one of us engaging in online church today. I especially ask for miracles. As Pastor Haley is preaching today, Lord, would you release miracles? Maybe they're financial, maybe they're health, maybe they're relational, but God, we ask you to move in powerful ways in people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, let's worship together.
I'm really looking forward to Mother's Day this year, but I have to be honest, uh, the last few years I haven't looked forward to it much. In fact, it's been quite a pain point in my life. Um, Jonathan and I got married about seven years ago and uh, we wanted to have a family, but when we started trying to grow our family, we faced some real medical issues and um, some hard diagnoses and ultimately uh, an infertility diagnosis that would require IVF as the only possible way to pursue biological children. I thought that IVF was a shot a day and then like a baby. When all was said and done, it was over 900 shots I had to give myself. Early on, I started inviting people within the church to pray with me for this. This was something that I wanted. I wanted a family. And so I thought, what better than to have people praying? It even included some children, like my friend Chi Chi's daughter, Sophie. I was praying for Mr. Jonathan, Pastor Amanda, to have a baby that could be in my little sister or my little brother. We were all in, like, in your living room, and me and Kobe, we were praying for you. And, it was, and we were also playing worship music, and it was just like, it was just like in the moment, and it felt so like surreal, and it was just so like I could feel like Jesus was there with us. Around week eight, we had a pregnancy loss, and I had to share that with the people that had been praying with me, and um, I had to share that with Sophie. It was a profound moment to share um, both my prayer request and my grief. Um, with those people. And so not only did that uh, group of people pray for me, they grieved with us and they supported us through those moments, including Sophie. Her mom, Chi Chi, and I fasted for three days. And then we decided to break fast and Sophie and Kobe and Chi Chi came over the house and we worshiped and we read scripture and we prayed before I started that third cycle. And it was a powerful time where I knew the Lord was going to do a miracle, but I didn't quite know what that miracle looked like just yet. So we started that third cycle and I was pregnant again. This time I was terrified. I had a lot of grief still and I was anxious about what could happen. I was doubting whether this was going to be successful. Um, I was doubting whether I'd have children but I knew that God's people, um, their faith could carry me in this season. We went into the transfer of this embryo. Um, I went in extremely nervous, um, nervous for another loss. And the doctor transferred the embryo. And then he grabbed Jonathan, my mom, and my hand. And he said, I'm going to pray for us. And the doctor, the science, prayed in Jesus' name that that baby would stay. And so we left that day just so encouraged that God is the one who does the miracle. And so we returned week seven for our ultrasound and found out that we were having two babies. Um, and so Jesus really had done an incredible miracle. He had taken a hopeless, what felt like a really hopeless situation and he had produced a double blessing. I felt like tears coming because they were just so graceful and they were so pretty and just like just laying there 
and it felt like they were just like my children. Like I prayed for them, but it came out of you. Was it all about that? You did pray for them, and they are your children. They are your children. They're everybody who prayed for them because they're your miracle, and they're my miracle. And when you look at them, you're gonna remember that God is faithful to you. And when I look at them, I'm gonna remember that God is faithful to me. We have a God of miracles, and we are celebrating moms this evening. And uh, before we pray for the moms in this room and the moms watching online, I do want to just say that some of you in this room may be a bit like Amanda was. There's some pain surrounding Mother's Day. Maybe you've lost your mom recently. Maybe there's some estrangement with a mom. Maybe you are a, a waiting mom or a waiting dad. And we acknowledge that. And God says, God has promised that he is close to a broken heart. You can know his presence in this room in your life tonight. Amen. Well, miracle moms. Um, you know, I think as we look at motherhood, it is a miracle. Whether uh, moms come through a little bit of science, through miracles, through the natural way, whether a mom is made through adoption or fostering, when we see that self-sacrificing, giving it all, um, I will never give up on you kind of love that moms show us. We see the love of God. That's really what motherhood and fatherhood demonstrates. It's a little glimpse of the powerful love of God that, ha that he has for each of us in this room. And I would like to invite um, all the moms in this room to stand. If you're a mom, stand. We want to pray, at Victory Church, a blessing upon you. God sees you. God sees you. And in this role, he's there to equip you and help you, whether you have a two-month-old or a 60-year-old. <laughs> My husband's mom has a 65-year-old. <laughs> but you're still a mom, and your heart never changes to your kids. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I just thank you for these wonderful women. Lord, through these broken vessels, your love brilliantly shines and I pray in the name of Jesus they would feel your blessing upon their lives and as they parent their children no matter how old they are Lord they would sense your empowerment your wisdom and your strength and I thank you Lord that as we watch the day in day outness of motherhood Lord we get a glimpse of the goodness of God himself I bless these women in Jesus powerful name amen Amen. Let's give them a hand as they're sitting down. Go moms, go moms. And um, I would be remiss not to take a moment and pray for those watching online or those in this room who are waiting for that baby, moms or men and women who are standing for that miracle. So will you join me and join our faith in prayer? Heavenly Father, I'm just going to offer up a very simple prayer because the power is in your hands, not in my prayer. Lord, we lay our fear and our um, discouragement at your feet, and we join our faith. And Lord, we're asking you, the God of miracles, to do what is impossible. Lord, what is impossible with man is possible with you. And Lord, I pray you'd fill bellies and arms with miracle babies. In Jesus' name. And just like Amanda did, Lord, we will give you the praise because you are good and you are kind. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, moms, on your way out, we have a miracle mom prayer card we'd like to put in your hands. So happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you for who you are and all you do. Amen. Perhaps you've heard the stories of how God comes to the rescue how God breaks through. Look at what he does to get our attention and look at who he uses to accomplish his mission. Come and see why God does what he does. The Miraculous. Well, hello, Victory Church. Happy Mother's Day again to all the moms here with us in the room. 
and online. My name is Haley Riley, and I'm uh, the worship pastor here, and um, this is my second Mother's Day as a mom, uh, myself. And a lot of you guys would have seen my sweet little one-year-old uh, Rowan running around the lobby on a Sunday morning. Um, and last year, as a two-month-old baby, Rowan's gift to me was sleeping through the night for the very first time the night before Mother's Day. So, we'll see if he can top that this year. <laughs> a lot of parents in the room, you would know that that was a miracle, right? <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> And, you know, we've already acknowledged it, but I want to say again that as much of a joy as it is to celebrate so many of our moms, I know there are a number of us here and online who have a difficult time on Mother's Day because of loss or separation or an unmet desire for children. And I truly believe, as we've already prayed, that God is going to meet you through this message today. And I know some of you have already been so encouraged by Pastor Amanda's story. How powerful is her story? If you know her, you'd know that that testimony that we just saw barely scratches the surface of the miracles that she and her family have experienced. And I am believing today, right now, in this moment, whenever you're watching this, that God will do miracles in your life whether it's today or tomorrow or the next, God is going to do a miracle for you. So let's pray for that right now. Dear Jesus, we say thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you that you are not a distant God, but that you want to show yourself to us and to show yourself to the people around us. So we thank you. We thank you for the testimony of those who have experienced your miracle working power. And we ask that you would come and reveal yourself to us in that way today. We are so expectant. So come, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today I want to share with you the story of a woman from the Bible, a mom, <laughs> who experienced the miraculous. We meet this woman in 1 Kings chapter 17 because of her interaction with the prophet Elijah. Most of you have probably heard about the prophet Elijah. But before we talk about this story, let's talk a little bit about him and what was happening in the culture at that time. Elijah is one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. He's considered, and you'll see his name all throughout the Bible, he's considered to be the model for other prophets. And in 1 Kings, um, Elijah appears almost out of nowhere to the king of Israel at that time, and that's King Ahab. Ahab's reign is often considered to be the epitome of evil. 1 Kings 16.33 says that Ahab did more to arouse the anger of God, of the Lord, the God of Israel, than all of the kings of Israel before him. And if you know anything about Israel's history, you would know that there's some bad stuff in that history of kings. Under Ahab's rule, Israel's worship of the true God, our God, was under threat. Ahab married Jezebel. She was a foreigner who brought with her pagan worship of Baal and made it prominent in Israel. And, you know, when we say that she brought the worship of Baal in, it's not that they were just worshiping some other god than the true god. You know, this kind of worship was really evil, was really evil. It included all kinds of practices that break God's heart and would break your hearts, things like child sacrifice. And because of Jezebel's influence, Ahab allowed almost all of Israel's God-worshipping prophets to be killed. Their schools were wiped out. The people of Israel were losing their faith in God. In a time of such wickedness, God needed to get people's attention. Great evil like was seen under Ahab, required great works of God through a prophet like Elijah. So to keep faith in Israel, God chose to work through the miraculous. 
Now the prophet Elijah, he escaped being killed by Jezebel, and he went to King Ahab, and he pronounced drought on the land as a result of their idolatry, and it happened. God told Elijah where to escape to, and there God provided for Elijah with food and water, and he kept him safe, continued to keep him safe from Ahab and Jezebel. And we're not gonna unpack this story today, but this in itself was a miracle of provision and protection. So let's get back to the woman who encounters Elijah. We'll turn to 1 Kings 17, 7 to 14. Elijah had been in that place. There was a brook where God had directed him, but now the water supply had dried up. So, watch for it. God was getting ready to provide for Elijah yet again. Here's what it says. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. There are a few things I want us to take note of as we have heard this story. First, Zarephath was a Gentile city. In fact, this was the very region that Jezebel was from. So put yourself in Elijah's shoes for just a second here. God had just saved you from Jezebel, who was going around literally killing all of the prophets. Your mission is to show God's truth to Israel, who was caught up in worshiping false gods, and God decides to send you into enemy territory for help? This would have been a challenging move. And second, God sent Elijah to a widow. If it wasn't unlikely enough already, God told Elijah to meet a widow who in ancient culture had the lowest of places in society. Women had to completely rely on men for resources, and so when a husband died, widows were generally left destitute. It was up to a son or another male relative to take care of her. And so, though this woman, she had a son, it would seem that the son was probably too young to actually be caring for her at this time. So as we meet this widow, she's gathering up sticks at the gate of the city, and commentators write that this action of the gathering sticks, it actually implies that she was in extreme poverty, because though there was a drought, a drought doesn't mean a lack of wood. So this woman, through whom God had promised to provide food to Elijah, had nothing, nothing but her home. And she tells Elijah exactly that. She had no bread to share. In fact, she's preparing a final meal for her and her son. She's getting ready to die. And I think we so often forget that these stories we read in the Bible, they're not fairy tales. These are real people who faced real needs. So can you imagine this? Imagine the defeat she must have been feeling as she prepared to make this last meal, as she resigned herself to the knowledge that she couldn't, as a mother, save her own son, provide for her own son, that she was ready to go and starve. She had no hope that she and her son could make it through this drought. And it's to this woman, in this desperate and heartbreaking situation, that Elijah makes what at face value is honestly a ridiculous request. 
Elijah essentially says, don't be afraid, go do what you said you were gonna do, but first make me some bread. (laughs) Then God will make sure you have enough oil and flour to last through this drought, I promise. (laughs) (sighs) If I was that woman, I'd probably be like, um, hello, sir, did you not just hear me say, I only had enough for me and my son and we were literally gonna go die? Hello. (laughs) This situation is worthy of fear. Let's be honest, it's worthy of fear. And he says, do not be afraid. And you want her to make some stranger some bread first with the very little they have left and deprive her own son of that. And even more so, why would she expect God to provide for her? It's likely that she believed in God, but not necessarily as her God. She probably worshiped Baal. People there would have known about the God of Israel, but the promises were not directed towards them. They were directed to Israel. So she had no reason to believe that God would help her. But... God told Elijah he would provide. Elijah believed God. He believed what he was telling this woman. And so, this ridiculous request, the ask Elijah is really making is for the widow to also trust in God's promise. Most of us probably wouldn't blame her if she had said sorry, but no. So let's turn back to verse 15 and see how she responded. It says, she went away and did as Elijah told her. She did it. She did as Elijah told her. So, there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word the Lord spoke by Elijah. Against all logic, this widow chose to trust the promise. In an act of obedience to God, this Gentile woman made Elijah some bread and God provided. You see, God's commands are promises. God commanded Elijah to go to the widow, and he commanded the widow to provide for Elijah, and in turn, she would be provided for. And it showed that God had control where Baal did not. You see, Baal was a god of storms, of rain, of fertility of the land, of producing things, and there was drought. There was no rain. And where God could not, or Baal, sorry, Baal could not provide for this woman who was ready to starve, God came through with the provision. And on his, Baal's soil, no less, (laughs) we know it was God's. It didn't matter that this woman was a Gentile, that the other promises weren't directed toward her at the time. Jesus himself spoke about this woman in Luke 4, 25 to 26. He said, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. There were many widows in Israel who could have been on the receiving end of this miracle. Yet God called Elijah to this woman, to this widow, and God showed himself trustworthy to her, whether or not she knew him before, whether or not she was thinking of God. Even once before, God came to her, God saw her need, and he proved himself trustworthy. He provided the flour that would not be used up and the oil that did not run dry. God was true to his word. And this was a miracle of provision for Elijah just as much as it was for the widow and her family. And as they daily used the flour and used the oil that they had in front of them, they had to continue to trust God to provide for the next day and the next day and the next day. So as they made their bread for the day and they ate and they were satisfied, they had to trust that tomorrow it would be there too. And in doing so, day after day after day, for probably a few years, 
both Elijah and the widow learned to put their continued faith and trust in the provider rather than in the provision. The ridiculous request, an act of obedience, there might be a step of faith you have to take before your miracle comes. Earlier this year, my family and I, we were looking for a new place to live. Our little baby boy, he was up and running around and growing, and we were outgrowing our apartment. And so we started looking, and we continued to pray um, that God would give us the right place at the right time. And that was my prayer. I felt like God gave me to pray throughout this season for the right place at the right time. And after months of searching, we found one in the right area that was about the right size and layout and things that we were hoping for and we applied for the house, and we got accepted, and when it came time to decide whether or not we'd move into this place, um, we just felt God tell us to say no. And we had already given our notice to the apartment we were living in, so time was running out. We had no other options on the horizon. After months of searching, we hadn't found anything else we really um, were ready to move into. There were, we had no other applications in, nothing. So we said no, <laughs> and almost immediately, we found a house the day it was listed, and we were the first people to tour it the next morning. And um, there were so many other little bits and pieces to this story where you knew God was orchestrating this. Um, and the moment we walked into that house for the tour, we knew that this was the place that God had provided for us, the right place at the right time. And it was far better than the one we had almost moved into, so much better, and honestly, it was better than anything we had hoped for, and we knew it was God. So when it seemed crazy to us to say no to that other house, God knew he had something better planned. So my situation, it wasn't life or death, and you know, it might not even be as big of a deal as the miracle that you are believing God for right now. But I know, I know for a fact that we can obey a trustworthy God. What miracle might be on the other side of a ridiculous request and an act of obedience? So back to this woman. Can you imagine the day that the oil just kept flowing, that the flower just kept coming? Can you imagine the hope that was restored on that day? The future that this mother began to imagine for her and for her son as each day, each day unfolded and still they were alive, they had food to eat. As God provided for her and her family, she may have felt more and more confident in God, more secure in her future as her son would be able to grow up and provide for her. (laughs) Praise God. All of this hope had been restored. God showed himself trustworthy to her. He showed himself as provider, sustainer, as a giver of life. And then tragedy strikes. Let's go back to 1 Kings, verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Remember the loss of the son in this situation was also a loss of hope for her future. Yet again, she blamed herself for the loss, her sin, and she doubted God's purposes in all of this. So Elijah replies, he says, give me your son. He took him from her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on the bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house, and he gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. 
Here, tragedy is turned over to a trustworthy God. In the midst of the widow's doubt, her questioning, her uncertainty in all of this, her hopelessness, yet again, the widow was quick to hand her son to the man of God. You see, when she first met Elijah, she was resigned to die, for her son to die. But then she experienced that life-giving miracle. God sustained her and her son with food throughout the drought. So this time, when tragedy struck, she didn't want her son to die. She wasn't prepared to go home and die. Her doubt didn't stop her from entrusting her son to Elijah. But even Elijah wondered what God's plan here was. (laughs) And yet, he immediately cried out to God on her behalf. One commentator writes that Elijah's faith in the midst of uncertainty allows God to use him to demonstrate God's life-giving power, his constant watchfulness, and his compassion, even to those outside of the elect nation. So we see that the very same God who provided oil and flour provided life for the widow's son. The widow, the son, and even Elijah They had an encounter with the giver of life. With the giver of life. God's a provider, sustainer, God, the giver of life. So did these miracles happen just because Elijah, as we started with, was some great prophet, because he was a man of God, as even the widow herself said at the end? Remember that Elijah himself needed a miracle. He was in a desperate place. He was fleeing from people in power who wanted to kill him. He was in need of food and water and shelter. (laughs) James 5, 13 to 18, it reminds us that Elijah, he was a human just like us. Let's read what it says. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. So why did Elijah experience all these miracles and even more that we're not even beginning to touch today? It's not necessarily because he was so great a prophet We learn from James that first, he lived righteously. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So for us, we live righteously by pursuing God's glory over anything else, by seeking to become more and more like Jesus every single day, and knowing that it's only by God's own work in us that makes us righteous. And as we live righteously, the Holy Spirit moves us to pray effectively. So second, Elijah, he prayed. As we saw Elijah do and as was encouraged in James, what do we do when we're in trouble, when we're sick, when we've sinned? We pray. We pray earnestly. We pray for the miracle. We follow the Spirit's prompting. Sometimes, maybe a lot of times, We may not experience the miracle. We don't know how long the widow had been starving. Maybe she was saving every last bit of food that she could find, hoping for something to change. And she got to that place of hopelessness. She had nothing left. But we do know that God had a plan, and he saw her need. Third, Elijah and the widow trusted God. 
Even when God's commands didn't seem to make sense, Elijah believed God. The same can be said about the widow. She wasn't a prophet, and yet we can follow her example of faith when she had no reason to believe that God would be true to his promise, she obeyed. And you and I, we have, I'd say, a little bit of an advantage over this widow. We have seen God move. We have heard testimonies of his faithfulness through his word, through the story we heard today, through a story of a friend, Many of us, like Elijah, have experienced God's provision in some way or another ourselves. And God's sovereignty, it calls us to trust him and to obey him. His ability to provide and to heal and to protect us, it shows that he is trustworthy. When we pursue God and we continue to put our trust in him, we put ourselves in a position to receive a miracle. We'll be ready to say yes to that ridiculous request when it comes and to follow with an act of obedience to obey the God who we can surely trust. And even when we ourselves are in need of a miracle, God can use us to see a miracle come to pass in other people's lives. We aren't meant to do this on our own. When Elijah himself was in that desperate situation, he was able to help lift the widow and her son out of their place of desperation. They cared for one another, and that is what we are here for, church. So I want to pray for a couple groups of people right now. So if you are here in this room tonight, or if you're joining us online Let's pray. The first group I want to pray for is those who are feeling like they are too resigned to death. You're tired of praying for your miracle. When it feels like God is rewarding your obedience to his word, like the woman in the flower <laughs> providing for the prophet, when he seems like he's rewarding it with suffering, like when the widow lost her son, when it seems like death is more prevalent than life, when it's difficult to believe in the life-giving power of God, if you are at the end of believing for a miracle and you have no prayers left in your body, I wanna pray for you today. And to those who are desperate for a miracle, You're ready to see a miracle right now. You're believing for it. You know, sometimes it takes an extreme crisis for us to turn to God. The widow's son's death, maybe a pandemic. A Baylor University academic study has data that says those whose lives are unstable, uncertain, or threatened are more likely to experience a miracle. So if you're someone who society would call maybe disadvantaged, I want you to know this. God sees you, he sees your desire for him, and he is ready to meet you. Your place of greatest need is a place of opportunity for God to do something even greater. And to those of you who are in this room or watching this, and you just desire more of God, I want to encourage you, get desperate. Get desperate on behalf of your neighbor who is crying out. Get desperate on behalf of the person who is at the end of their prayers, who no longer believes for that miracle. I hope you feel ready to get desperate before God. So right now, if you are any of those people, if you are resigned to death, if you are desperate for a miracle, if you, or if you desire more of God, wherever you are right now, I want to encourage you to stand to your feet. Don't be shy. Just stand to your feet. It's just an act of saying, God, I'm here, and I'm ready to meet you. You might have nothing left to give him, but you're open to what he has. So right now, 
for the person who can't believe anymore for their miracle. God, we stand alongside them, we lift their heads. We pray on their behalf, God, for you to intervene in their lives. Lord, would you come and move in power? Would you revive? Would you restore? Would you encourage? Would you lift weary heads? Would you take away burdens? Would you refresh them in a way they haven't felt refreshed in maybe years, God, when they feel like they're tired of being the strong one, of the one persevering, of pushing through, of praying and praying, and their knees are just worn out? God, would you meet them right now and just do a miracle of life-giving power in them. Even as we pray right now, we stand with them and we, we say, remember the miracles that you have seen. They might not have been yours, but he's the same God as the one who provided the oil, who provided the flour, and he's going to do something in you right now. When it's hard, Lord, help our unbelief, restore our trust in you, for you are a trustworthy God. And for those who are desperate for a miracle, would you come and meet them? We are pursuing you with all that we have, and God, we know that it's not reliant on us that our miracle comes, but we are saying, come. So whether it's healing, whether it's the restoration of a relationship, maybe a a parent who's praying for a child to come back home, to come to Jesus. God, would you begin to stir those hearts right now? Would you begin to heal people's bodies? Would you heal people's minds? Would you heal their souls, God? Would you come and make broken things come back to life, come back together in Jesus' name? God, we believe that you can do it. We believe that you want to do it. We're not afraid to ask God according to your will. So we ask that you would come, do miracles in this place, do miracles in the lives of those watching this at home or wherever they are. And God, may you get all of the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated for just a minute. I don't want to leave tonight without giving an opportunity for people to um, come to Jesus, maybe for the first time to have an encounter with that giver of life. So if you wanna say come, you've seen maybe just a taste of what God can do and you say I want that, would you repeat this prayer after me and everybody here is gonna pray it alongside with you. He's gonna come and make your life new. Say dear Jesus, thank you for being the giver of life. Today I choose to walk in that life. Forgive me for the things I've done wrong. I turn from my old way of life. And I choose to follow you, Jesus. I trust in your promise to forgive me and give me new life, just as you died and were raised to life for me. Thank you for the miracle of salvation in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Well, if you just prayed that prayer, expect something good from God. He's ready to meet with you. He's just entered into your life and it's never gonna be the same. It will never be the same. Church, if you see God move as a result of our prayers tonight or any time throughout this series, please let us know because I hope that you feel encouraged from hearing the stories of miracles from Pastor Amanda, from the scripture, and we wanna be able to continue to encourage people to believe for what God can do, because he is a miracle working God, and he's not done yet. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, congratulations, your life, your eternity is forever changed. And hey, maybe you decided to rededicate your life to Jesus today. Expect change in powerful new ways. If you did decide, please let us know you did. We'd love to celebrate with you. You can let us know with the info on the screen. We're gonna send you a free Bible, but we're also gonna connect you with spiritual growth opportunities like our growth track and baptism. Congratulations, though. You made the best decision. And hey, 
It is almost June, which means summer life groups have almost started and you belong in a life group. We've got online groups if you are at a distance, but if you are close to us, I wanna encourage you to go ahead, log on to getvictory.net slash groups and take a look at some of our in-person groups. I can't tell you what an encouragement life groups have been in my life. Even in the high highs and the low lows, no matter what, I've been a part of a life group and God has encouraged me through others. Uh, he's introduced me some, to some great friends and some great connections, and I have experienced more of what it's like to be the church through life groups. So go ahead, take a look at all the options. There's over 50 this summer. I know that there's one that's going to work for your schedule, your interests, and also works for your family. So take a look at those and sign up today. Because of your giving, people are empowered to invite their world into an experience with God and the care of his family. These opportunities include church online, in-person worship services, big days of service, and life groups. There are two easy and secure ways you can partner with us through your giving. You can text Get Victory to 77977, or you can visit getvictory.net slash give. Well, church, thanks for engaging in worship with us today. We can't wait to see you next week. But before we do, why don't you like, share, and subscribe so we can keep connected all week long. See you next week. Just think of